And now uh, it is my very distinct honor to introduce another former boss and dear friend, Senator Pete V. Domenici. Senator Domenici, after representing the land of enchantment, New Mexico, for 36 years, is now a senior fellow at what else? The Bipartisan Policy Center. He holds the longest uh, distinction of having been the longest serving chairman of the Senate Budget Committee. And I can tell you that record will stand, oops, my timer went off, oops. <laughs> Couple more seconds. Uh, uh, he'll hold that record. Why? Because uh, there were rules were changed in the Senate uh, Republican Caucus that put time limits after the senator had served there. So he will be the, he will be in the record books the longest serving ever. But there's one story that I'd like to uh, relate to you that captures the essence of Senator Domenici. Ira Shapiro's uh, recent book entitled "The Last Great Senate." tells about an incident when the then White House Chief of Staff, Ken Duberstein, a former Javis staffer, visited Senator Javis in the hospital who was suffering from ALS. Duberstein told Senator Javis that President Reagan was trying without success to get Senator Domenici to support a 77% increase in the defense budget and he was not having any success. And Duberstein wanted to know from Senator Javis what he could do to get Domenici's support. Javis, paralyzed in a wheelchair and having difficulty speaking, nonetheless responded, Ken, you have to understand, when Pete thinks about a decision, what comes first is the state of the nation, and second is the institution of the Senate. If those two factors work, he might go with the president. My recollection is, Senator, you did not. <laughs> Senator Domenici, along with Alice Rivlin, continued to work today, just yesterday, in front of the Senate Finance Committee for the State of the Nation. Senator Domenici. First, and first, I might say to Bill, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind remarks. Second, uh, I would like to share with all of you that uh, a personal thing. Uh, just recently, I celebrated my uh, birthday. And I, if you hadn't read about it, I would like you to guess, but I won't do that. But I can tell you, I've just passed the 80th birthday. And I can assure you that 75 is better. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sure that 78's better, 79's better, and I don't know what I'm going to do about it. But I have more aches and pains than I ever had in my life, and I, they've just come on like, uh, well, 80th birthday, here they come. <laughs> Anyhow, um, New Mexico is having a celebration, Bob, downtown for their 100th anniversary and, uh, as statehood. And uh, I was thinking, as I, as I listened uh, to the previous speaker, and I, if he was, if the re, we'd have been reversed, I would have told him, I'm, I'm not one of those you're talking about. Uh, I'm Republican, but I'm not one of, of those that he was talking about and worried about. But I would have told him, uh, as, uh, as one of those, I am worried about one monstrous thing, and that is whether America can produce the kind of growth we have in the past to satisfy what we have all assumed was what America would provide for us by either by way of opportunity or assurance or insurance as we're talking about here tonight. Now, back to New Mexico. My father arrived from Italy as a 13-year-old boy about eight or 10 years, 12 years before statehood. That's something, isn't it? And he tells me that before he died, that the Albuquerque, New Mexico, if any of you have been there, my biggest city in New Mexico, that we didn't even have paved streets there. Uh, they were just one that was paved with wood, and the others were paved with clay when he arrived in America. It seems like a, you know, those far-off jungle times that, we were, that was referred to a while ago. Now, having, having talked about 
the kind of things that I want to talk about personally. I want to tell you that it's a pleasure to come and speak in behalf of the honoree, because in, in this government of the United States and the actions that people take and do, um, if, if you associate with people and if you watch them and listen to them and know that they, how they ruled and then how they voted publicly, you begin to determine what kind of people they are. And I can tell you the CBO will go down in history and, and it will be said that Alice Rivlin was the first CBO director, but it will go down and there's no doubt about it that it wouldn't be what it is but for Bob Reichauer because he too was part of it, if not uh, in actual legal terms, in practical terms, uh, he was an equal, and uh, this country will have one thing to really, that really helps us in our activities to try to keep our country a great country, and that's the CBO and what it does in its principal job. So Bob uh, can, on, can, be, can hold up this honor and say, I got this honor, but I want to tell you, he has these other honors that I'm speaking of. The one I'm speaking of is what happened to him in his work day by day. And I can tell you, you don't get a reputation unless there's some characteristics about you that are significant and, and that are loved and that are admired. And this man has a lot of those. One of them is integrity. I don't think we spoke enough about that. There is no question, but he has had in his lifetime as many opportunities as any public servant has had to make a big decision that made a difference, that had people on both sides, that was partisan and really pulling, and he took a long time and decided what was right. The toughest decision that he made at CBO without question was when we were talking about Bill Clinton's health care and he had to decide whether the means of collecting the revenue to pay for this was a tax or not. And if it was a tax, the plan died. Well, it didn't die, but it died because we had to go back and do something. And everybody, every politician knew what that meant, and he must have too. But the, when it came time to rule, he ruled it's a tax. A tax is a tax. You can't get around it. I guarantee you, if his hair was not as gray as it is because he was young then, the gray hair began to grow when he made that decision. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Now, having said that, uh, I want to assure all of you that there are still many of us, uh, I've already told you my age, that tells you I'm not going to be around for too long and helping, pushing to make, to get Congress and presidents to make right decisions wherever I can, that you know that. But I can assure you that we have behind us the kind of strength of character that this man has left us and that's evidenced by his work that will give us the things we can build on and keep this great nation moving ahead, providing for our people the things that uh, we know are America and American. I want to close by saying uh, it has been my privilege for the last two and a half, three years while I retired while I am retired, to try nonetheless to be helpful in matters that are difficult and with those who are having difficulty finding solutions that will work. And uh, when I get down in the dumps, some people would say that when I get down, when I get depressed, uh, it, it is generally because I'm making a decision that our country can't solve its problems cannot solve its problems. And that's not a good feeling, I assure you. If you've been here uh, like I, if you came here like I did, the son of an immigrant father who never learned English, yet was a huge success in life. He was smart enough to find bilingual secretaries way back there that spoke both Italian and English. And when things really got bad, he got one that spoke Italian, Spanish, and English. And, uh, and, and, and he made it. But, but the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, and, and there went one of my 80th, what I was telling you, left my brain. So I'm going to think a little, Dr. Solo, and see if I, it'll come back. If not, you'll have to forgive me on my test, my, because I'm forgetting what I was going to say. 
But, no, but let, me, let, me, let me just conclude and say you have to fill in what I was just saying, okay? <laughs> and, and I will say, and I will say that uh, working with, got it, working with Congress and with those who are trying to make decisions for our country, we do run across really great people that give us, you know, that we stand in awe. We wonder how they did it. We're so thrilled to see it that whatever, whatever we're down in the dumps about leaves because we're privileged to meet and be with, associate with people like your honoree. They give us inspiration, aspiration, and everything we need. And I think that he ought to be very proud that, that this institution that pushes so hard in an area that he is so certain is right for the people of his country, that we get there, that we get there again and move ahead, and that will happen. And he will be part, he and people like him will be our leaders that will look at and look to to get answers. Thank you all very much, and congratulations to you. Some of you may have noticed that the senator was wearing a button. It is, uh, I found it in my drawer at home, 1989-1995, a skunk, a picture of a skunk, the Reichar years. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>